afternoon, everyone. Welcome to um, the latest uh, webinar in our lunchtime lecture series on climate action and sustainability uh, coming from Trinity. Uh, my name is John Galler, as always. I'm, I'm your kind of facilitator and host of the series. Um, uh, and just to kind of, uh, as always, give you an overview of, of where we're at and why we're doing this. For those of you who are new to the, to the programme, we're just essentially sharing knowledge and perspectives to address national and global challenges. We're in uh, webinar number seven of 12, so we're past the halfway stage. Um, we have a session this, obviously, today and next week, and then we have one week break where we then uh, continue part three after um, the Easter break. So um, just to note that one break for those of you who are joining throughout. And indeed, um, why are we doing this? Well, all of our speakers are contributing and undertaking research and uh, activity that has an impact on climate action and um, sustainability. And so um, perhaps each speaker pr pr presents their, their linkage to our national priorities and also perhaps to our SDGs, because I think it's important to contextualize our work at a national and international level. Um, and uh, really the, the individual that will be uh, uh, presenting uh, how their work links to these and indeed what their work and research is. Today is my great pleasure to in invite uh, my colleague uh, from the School of Chemistry, Professor Yuri Gunko. Uh, we've known each other for a few years now, just throughout the, the COVID period per uh, uh, in particular, where we've uh, explored ideas together and research. Um, and um, Yuri's focus is circular economy, but in the context of advanced emerging materials. And Yuri, I'm looking forward to your, to your talk, to hear about your work. I'm going to stop sharing and allow you to, to take over. Thank you very much, John, for the nice introduction. Good, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so I will uh, share my screen first. And for those of you as well, um, if you have any questions at any time, just add them to the Q&A and at the end of the session, raise your hands and I can invite you to, to give a question directly to Yuri. So Yuri, over to you and look forward to yeah, your, yeah, to your yeah, talk. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Can you see the screen? Yes, perfectly. Yeah, great. All right. So um, as uh, John already said, I'm a professor of inorganic chemistry and uh, circular economy is actually a new area for myself. Uh, but because my expertise is actually in advanced materials and, uh, and nanomaterials, nanoscience as well. So uh, I'm trying today to kind of justify these directions maybe for research, which is quite uh, new emerging. And uh, first I start for a presentation, what kind of research interest we have in our group and watch research activities. So we work on uh, photovoltaic cells and luminescent solar concentrators, which is of course used for energy harvesting. We also work in, in the area of quantum dots. So light emitting materials and uh, done quite a lot of work on applications of quantum dots. And more importantly, we've done a lot of work on investigation of interactions of quantum dots with biological materials, with uh, live cells. For example, this is a uh, human microphages with these quantum dots inside. Uh, we work quite uh, extensively with magnetic nanostructures, uh, again, for various applications, starting from uh, magnetic resonance imaging so using them in vivo and also for making various composite materials based on magnetic nanomaterials, for example, uh, glues which are activated by a magnet and so on. And we also work in the area of membranes, uh, mostly developing new types of membranes uh, using two dimensional nanomaterials for water purification and for nanofiltration applications. So I believe if uh, we look at these topics, I hope I contribute to powering renewables because using, of course, solar, so, solar cells and uh, uh, luminescent solar concentrators with uh, light harvesting. We're working on alternative energy sources. Um, also, I hope I contribute to quality education uh, for the reason what uh, I'm a director of undergraduate teaching and learning in chemical sciences, and I'm also director of uh, a postgraduate diploma course uh, called Circular Economy and Recycling Technologies. Of course, uh, I hope we're contributing to water purification, affordable clean energy, and climate actions. 
So now returning back to the topic, uh, circular economy for advanced imagined materials. So probably first question we need to ask ourselves what advanced materials are, what kind of materials we're talking about here. So advanced materials by definition is a new types, uh, a new type of materials which uh, have enhanced properties and which are intentionally designed for some superior performance uh, to outperform conventional materials. And examples you can see in this slide. So this is nanomaterials, various advanced polymeric materials, polysiloxanes, for example, silicones, biomaterials, carbon fibers, so nickel on fibers, composite materials, again, materials which contain a number of different materials with added value, added properties, two-dimensional materials like graphene, uh, transition metal dichloridinides, and so on. So, of course, a reasonable question here is uh, why advanced materials are so important. So, advanced materials, of course, is one of the main drivers for developing of new technologies and new products, new devices. So, therefore, they deserve a lot of attention. So, particularly over recent time, uh, due to development of artificial intelligence, machine learning, and so on, there are significant progress in design of, uh, non, of advanced materials. Basically, you can design, design materials on demand with predicted properties. And since you can design new material, uh, you can also look at the circularity of this material potentially, potentially to see the, what the consequences of the design. Do you, maybe do you need to design it at all? Maybe it's not need to design uh, uh, from the very beginning. So it opens a lot of uh, new interesting opportunities. Uh, however, it also opens a lot of new challenges. So first question is again, why uh, circular economy should you be used for advanced materials and why it should be done now? So the reason is advanced materials are crucial components for emerging future waste streams. And these are uh, some examples of important, important emerging waste streams. So, of course, everyone knows what lithium-ion batteries is one of them, because we have increased the use of uh, electric cars. Uh, by 2040, uh, 2040, basically, we have uh, mm, about between three to 550,000 tons of uh, lithium-ion batteries as waste. And uh, these batteries are very hazardous pollutants. They contain a lot of toxic elements and contain a lot of toxic uh, substances in there. And there is no any proper even way to actually to dispose them, uh, to recycle them. More importantly, they also contain very valuable elements like lithium, cobalt, copper, nickel, and so on. And these elements are very scarce. I'll return back to that in, in a moment. Then uh, another area is turbine blades. So if you see more and more wind turbines around and these turbine blades of course is a big problem why because these turbine blades is very hard to recycle currently we're almost considered to be unrecyclable why because we're constructed from polymeric composite materials which have normally high grade epoxy polyester stuff and they also reinforced with this glass or carbon fibers so this is a typical composite material and taking into account the amounts of them and how big they are, normally a standard blade normally is around 12.5 meter long. long. Uh, this makes increasingly difficult to deal with this stuff after to, to, when you need to recycle it. And by the 2050, we'll have about 43 million tons of wind turbines blaze waste available. And it's not clear what to do with them. Then area which is close to my activities is photovoltaics. So using photovoltaic cells to again, there is pretty much uh, important thing. What happening now? Uh, the, um, we accumulated quite a bit of panels, and uh, first PV panels are expected to be complete by cycle um, around 2030, and then we will face this multi-million ton waste from photovoltaics. So, which will be increasing and increasing all the time. And photovoltaic cells will contain a lot of toxic materials. 
Uh, however, in very small quantities, very which very hard to remove, hard to extract, they also potentially again contain some valuable materials, which is also could be reused. And uh, currently, there is no again proper you know, circularity for most of the photovoltaic, uh, photovoltaic cells have been developed. Then, if we move it to other streams, one very emerging and fast growing area is variables. So it's watches, wristbands, connected to the clothes, either, so all other gadgets. So this uh, stuff is increasingly dominating now in the market. And uh, basically worldwide shipment of variables are expected to reach to 279 million to 20 this year actually. So a significant increase. And problem is variables are made from composite materials which combine clothing, electronic devices, elastomers, uh, some smart fabric, solar cells, and also, of course, they also contain batteries. So, and again, currently there is no technology for proper uh, recycling of these materials. And current design trend, they don't even, even focus on what. So how do you going to recycle, for example, your wristband, your watch? To extract valuable metals from there and extract some all toxic stuff to remove it from there. That sounds almost like a mission impossible. And this is all belongs, of course, to e-waste, to electronic waste. And uh, all this stuff also contains uh, uh, heavy metals, uh, which is again potentially might have very severe health impacts if they're not recycled properly, if they're not dealt with this properly. And then again, another huge and emerging uh, waste stream is apparel and footwear. The total closing expected to grow to 150 million tons by 2050. 73% of textile waste is normally now incinerated or landfilled, put in a landfill, and the recycling rate is negligible. 1%, the best case scenario, which results in enormous uh, annual material losses. And uh, again, um, if you dispose in a landfill, uh, for example, wooden and cotton cloth will also decompose, producing greenhouse gases. So again, there is extended use of chemicals and various plastic fibers in uh, uh, the, these materials, which is increases amount of uh, microplastic pollution and uh, all our stuff associated with this one. So basically that's the big, big, very big problems. And uh, one thing which is important to mention, which is going in parallel, is uh, we, at the same time, having all these uh, emerging waste streams, we have a lack of a lot of very important materials. And these materials, if you look at them, they actually in these waste streams. For example, lithium ion batteries, you have lithium, which is very scarce element, cobalt, which is very scarce element, nickel, copper. So all of this is kind of alternative a periodic table which shows how little of some elements we left and pretty much all elements who, which is uh, in uh, red, orange, and uh, yellow, you see they actually in quite limited availability. At the same time, we have increased demand for these materials. So basically future technologies, particularly development of, for example, electric cars and batteries, they require at least quadruple uh, amounts of the present lithium production. So basically, amount of lithium which is will be needed in the near future has to quadruple. We will need threefold increase in uh, heavy rare metals, rare earth metals, for example, on uh, uh, for example F elements. We need uh, maybe let's say two times increase in uh, metals like tantalum. Uh, in amount of cobalt demand will go by at least four hundred percent up. Amount of nickel demand will go probably in two times. So all these elements will be in great demand. At the same time, we're all in these waste streams and all of that is strongly related to advanced materials. So one more big issue that many of these advanced materials actually not just materials, they are nanomaterials. So, and in this waste stream contains, contains all this so-called nano waste. So just to remind you, nano, nano materials contain, consist of nanoparticles, 
which is normally have a control dimension of an order of nanometers, so 100 nanometers or less. And this is a scale which normally we show how nanoparticles relate to common objects like atoms, molecules, biomolecules, proteins, bacteria, uh, cells. And you look at this here, it's uh, nanomaterials in this range between one nanometer to 100 nanometers, which is exactly in a range when you have this large biological molecules, proteins, nucleic acids, and so on. What does it mean? It means what nanoparticles can interact with these, these biological objects, biomolecules, in a completely different way, which uh, we still don't know everything about. They can bind to them. They can then penetrate through the cell membranes very easily, can penetrate, penetrate through the most of the biological barriers. For example, it's well known that nanoparticles can penetrate brain-blood barrier. And uh, consequences of that for health are pretty much unpredictable. They could be, could be a big disaster. And also, of course, you have to take into account that with all these nanoparticles, all these nanomaterials also, because of the waste, it also goes into the environment. So it goes into and uh, contributes to environmental pollution as well. So basically, from one hand, uh, it looks uh, very important to have these materials. At the same time, they look like extremely dangerous. So do we need to have them at all? Maybe we shouldn't have them. And that's one of uh, big questions. So here is just a snapshot diagram uh, of the uh, use of uh, nanomaterials, current use. So as you see, we use pretty much everywhere. We used in textiles and healthcare products, for example, cosmetics, biomedical application, some industrial applications like paint coatings and so on, food agriculture, for example, sensing devices, uh, nano capsules, uh, food packaging, electronics, of course, it's one of the major uh, areas where the nanomaterials used. Renewable energy sources, again, photovoltaic cells and so on, they use a lot of nanomaterials and environmental. So virus biocatalyst and so on. All these areas uh, involve the use of uh, nanomaterials. And uh, the use of nanomaterials, of course, in various applications uh, is uh, uh, extremely uh, uh, fast developing area. So it's very, very emerging very fast. So sometimes we can tell them it is even out of control. So, and uh, nanotechnology in overall in nanoscience attracted a lot of interesting discoveries. So uh, each time we're finding some new potential applications for nanomaterials, which might have significant commercial impacts. And uh, it's very important to uh, look at this just for applications, but not only for applications, for biological hazards. So uh, if you look at nanomaterials in waste, so basically there are two main, uh, there are many sources, of course, how nano waste can be generated. So depending on the different types of materials, uh, you can generate, of course, nano waste during the production of nanomaterials or from nano products, uh, which materials incorporated in. And there are basically nano waste sources can be divided into two big categories, uh, point sources and non-point sources. Point sources are, resulted uh, resulting directly from uh, release of nano waste into nature so examples of point sources is include storage manufacturing units uh, experimental labs waste water treatment factories and so on and uh, for example you can use for example household products which cosmetic products which contain personal care products which contain nanomaterials and which is simply disposed and uh, uh, released in the, uh, for example, a, in the environment. And then there are non-point sources, uh, which includes uh, nano waste generated uh, from uh, damage or deterioration of nano particle containing product, or maybe not even containing nano particle products. For example, paint. Paint frequently contains micro particles, but it can also contain uh, uh, nano particles. And paint uh, frequently contains, for example, components like zinc oxide, uh, titanium dioxide nanoparticles, which is widely used uh, in paint. So it's all white paint is normally containing these particles. And when paint degrades, uh, you cannot really control the degrade of the paint. Uh, you might have a release of big chunks of paint in atmosphere. You can also have release of small uh, nanoparticulate particles in the atmosphere as well. And this is non-point sources is also contributing and we know in, normally we're not even noticing them, but they're all around. 
So basically, you can have um, uh, engineered nanomaterials released during the production, in handling, transportation, during nano application manufacturing. So when we again mentioned the paint uh, composites, nano application use textiles, for example, sunscreens. Nobody controls how much sunscreen you using and how much sunscreen could be disposed and go and sunscreens contain for example zinc oxide nanoparticles or titanium dioxide nanoparticles and nano applications disposal again it still goes into incineration landfill or sewage treatment and again nobody really knows what happening after what with this so recycling of that is still big question mark here so therefore uh, we really have to do something here. So here are some examples. For example, uh, engineering nanomaterials can enter into fresh water during the production, due to the way, during the waste handling, from a consumer products, from landfill, uh, from a waste water treatment plants. But one way now it might end up, for example, in a fresh water. So once nano, nanomaterials contaminate the environment, they can spread out in various areas. Uh, as aerosols, as a dust, uh, we can it float in water, can be deposited in uh, soil sediments. Uh, uh, in fact, because nanoparticles are so small, uh, it's impossible, of course, to control them frequently, to measure even when the presence, and also impossible to control how they interact because they have a very large surface area and uh, various functional groups of the surface. They can interact with uh, uh, all other pollutants. For example, with plastics, with some toxic uh, pollutants, dyes, and so on, and they can form new type of pollutants. So basically, we don't even know what nanoparticles can do in the environment if they left there. They form a complete new new types of pollutants, which uh, could be potentially even more dangerous and more toxic than we expect. So therefore, nano uh, imagine nanomaterials and uh, engineered nanomaterials now considered to be also as emerging pollutants, so and which could be potentially extremely toxic and hazard and might have deteriorating impact on the environment. So consequently, what is required, we need to do something here. And this is again, without circularity and circular economy, it will be impossible to address uh, these issues here. However, currently we have more questions than answers. So question number one, are nanomaterials sustainable and safe by design? So I cannot answer this question now. So again, depends on the nanomaterial. Is it possible to produce nanomaterials using waste as a source without high energy and cost demand? Again, we don't know. Are nanoproducts used considered essential? I think it is essential because there are some alternative technologies where we have no alternative but to use nanoproducts. How nanoproducts can be maintained, repaired, reused, remanufactured, refurbished, regenerated, recycled? Again, it depends on the product, but again, it, a lot of questions here. Now, if you look at the uh, nanoproducts uh, cycle, so is it possible to minimize waste from all life cycle stages of nanoproducts? So again, question is, I don't know, so maybe. Is it possible to minimize the uh, release of hazardous substances on all life cycle stages of nanoproducts? It's another issue, again, which is hard to answer. Is it possible to ensure high quality sorting and removal of contaminants from nanoproduct waste? And so on. Again, hard to answer. And question, is it possible to track and manage nanomaterials and nanom information about these products uh, in a life cycle? Again, it's another question which we need to answer and which is very hard to answer at the moment. So basically, we need to integrate major nanomaterials with the circular economy one way or another. We need to address all this standard diagram, use, recovery, use. We need to look at the rational design of nanomaterials, green synthesis of materials. So we need to look at the, kind of, of course, economical aspect on that. We need to look at, uh, can we remove nanomaterials efficiently? For example, magnetic nanomaterials can be removed by a magnetic field, for example. We need to see if they can be tracked by using some uh, optical techniques, for example, fluorescent uh, microscopy or optical techniques, which you can see where the materials are. Again, we need to look at composite materials with uh, 
low and controlled release of, of uh, uh, imagine nanomaterials. We need to look again on uh, internet, in, in, intentional trans, transformations to support these new uses. And of course, we need to tune uh, materials to minimize any environmental impacts here. So this is kind of general things which I wanted to talk about now, a few things about our research, about our contributions to that. So our research is uh, taken on one example. We developing new membranes for nanofiltration and water purification, and we're using one of the two-dimensional material, which is called boron nitride, uh, which is nice white material, uh, very biocompatible. For example, it's used in the shades and cosmetics products. So it's not toxic. Uh, we have technique which allow us to functionalize boron nitride uh, by heating, producing partially oxidized boron nitride. When we, what we do, we do exfoliation of this material. Again, everything done in water. We're not using any dangerous polluting solvents. And then we're making a membrane out of this material. So this is a scan electron microscopy images of this membrane, stop views and cross links. So membranes, of course, is uh, nanoporous used for nanofiltration, and we tested these membranes for many applications, and they showed uh, excellent, pretty much outstanding performance. Against all standard dyes, we have pretty much 100% retention. Even we can do the filtering of Guinness, so you can basically convert stout into the lager, so this is, a, you know, how Guinness looks before, this is how Guinness looks after the filtration. So basically, we can remove all black stuff, uh, moreover, we can use our membranes to remove pretty much all nanoparticles. So they also capture all nanopollutants, nanoparticles, and eff efficiently remove them as well. However, of course, if, as we all know, uh, making a membrane, having a membrane is not uh, enough. Membranes are falling. Membranes have a certain capacity. For example, you use membrane for this nanofiltration, you remove all dyes, you remove all nanoparticles, but then membrane is blocked, fault, and it doesn't filter anything anymore. So basically particles, colloidal particles, micromolecules, which deposits it, deposit in the pore membrane, so they simply block everything. And uh, after that, you have to either throw out membrane, dispose it, or find a way to clean the membrane and reuse it. And our approach here for cleaning of membranes is to produce new type of so-called photocatalytic membranes, which could do photooxidation or photooxidation of pollutants under ambient light. And we introduced a, a composite membrane, which is based on boron nitride and uh, layered double hydroxides, LDHs. So this is some images. This is all two-dimensional two materials. And uh, these membranes, again, demonstrated superior performance in removal of dyes, like Evans blue, methylene blue, methyl orange, rhodamine B. So we have pretty much retentions varying between 97 to 100%. Uh, this is, again, how these membranes uh, uh, look, uh, particles of these membranes look uh, uh, under uh, electron microscope. And this is a cross-section cross of these membranes. And the important thing, what these membranes also photocatalytic. It means... If they do the dye filtration, for example, Evans blue, methyl orange, methylene blue, rhodamine B, you see the colors. So this is membranes already reached the capacity. After that, we expose them to the light. And this is uh, how they look like after the exposure to the light. And the ambient light, for example, for one day, they become all colorless. All dyes are photooxidized and removed. And we can reuse this membrane and again and again. So and that's a big advantage. So we're extending the life of a membrane. And to extend our life of a membrane, we're not using something like uh, polluting here, not using any toxic chemicals or anything. We're just using ambient light to destroy the dyes, to clean the membrane. And after that, we can use it in again and again. In our direction of our research, we're also making this uh, composite membranes, which is based on magnetic uh, two-dimensional materials and also again boron nitride. We're making this membrane which is uh, composite, for example, containing 60% of boron nitride, 40% of magnetic nanoparticles. And then um, what we can do, we can do so-called induction heating of our membrane. So, and uh, our experiments, we've shown some examples shown here. So basically we can heat uh, our membrane to 100 degrees Celsius within one second. So, of course, we can hit it even higher. And this is basically decomposes all our pollutants. So, 
with again using very efficient way because induction heating is extremely efficient. So virtually imagine one uh, second, 100 degrees Celsius. So all pollutants removed, burnt out, and then again membrane uh, can be used and reused and again. So I think time is running out for me, and I'd like to acknowledge my co-workers who are involved in this research, uh, Anya Kogan, Natalia garcia Domenes, Garrett D., and of course, sponsoring bodies, Science Foundation Island, Biorbic Center, our Bioeconomy Center, and our Amber Center. And of course, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Yuri. Um, a real uh, whirlwind, uh, I think, of, of uh, a lot, lot to absorb, I think, in, in your talk around um, the different challenges. And I think, it, I think this kind of follows from last week as well. Uh, there's huge challenges in addressing the circular economy. Uh, Yuri, um, uh, his research, you can find it through the Trinity uh, website, through our uh, research, but also he, he leads and is involved in several courses um, in the university that you can find through uh, tcd.ie forward slash courses as well. Um, just to, to post it to note next week, um, uh, Professor Philip Lawton from um uh, the School of Geography or School of Natural Sciences uh, will be talking about maybe a slightly different topic on our urban future. So uh, from nano to, to urban might be a slightly different scale. Hopefully you can join us there um, for that. And as always, we will share a recording uh, for those who have registered uh, for the session. And so even as always, if you can't attend live, as long as you've uh, registered, you'll get um, uh, a link to the event. But we have all our details and sessions uh, uploaded onto um, the Trinity YouTube channel. So thank you very much for everyone for joining this lunchtime. Uh, Yuri, it was a pleasure. Thank you very much once again. And for all of you, have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. All the best. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.